And it's so good to see you here. I'm glad that you are here today. Uh, we are continuing in our sermon series from Philippians. We'll be in, on page uh, 1166 if you're going to use one of the Bibles underneath the seats in front of you, or you can turn to Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 17. Now, if you don't have a Bible, we invite you to take one of our Bibles home with you, read it, and apply it to your life. We are firm believers that if we read God's Word and apply God's Word, He will change our lives. In fact, watch this. If your life has been changed by reading God's Word, would you raise your hand? All right, so here's what we want you to do. Take a, a Bible home, read it, and apply it, and you're going to experience that same transforming power. And I want to invite you to welcome our Parker campus who are joining us, who is joining us today. And uh, Parker, we are so glad that you're there. And I know Pastor Ruben made an announcement to you this morning, and we're going to make that same announcement to you as well, to our church family here, that we are delighted that God has allowed us to purchase property in Parker, and that you're going to have a church home. You won't have to meet every morning and set up and tear down in the afternoon, but we're excited about what God is doing there, how God is changing lives. And if you don't have a Bible there sitting in Alumni Hall right now, jump up, go grab a Bible that's sitting in the table in the back of the room or just grab one on your way out. But we're excited about what God is doing and praying for your vacation Bible school as it's rapidly approaching. This weekend, we are celebrating our freedom. If you plan on being out on the boat, on the lake, out on the lake in a boat this weekend, raise your hand. Flying the American flag, shooting off fireworks. It is, a, we have one person going out on the lake. <laughs> I guess everybody else is sane. You know not to go on the lake on the weekend. So, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking back to when I was a child and we would celebrate 4th of July or even as we would attend school at 8 a.m. as class would begin in the morning, the bell would ring and we would all stand up and we'd place our hands on our hearts. And we'd turn to the American flag and we would say the Pledge of Allegiance. And I'm reminded as a child that uh, waving the American flag during our 4th of July parades and we would applaud veterans and we would applaud the first responders and we would applaud the police and whoever else was in the line, we'd applaud them as they would come by. And I remember those feelings of patriotism. But the most patriotic season that I've ever experienced uh, happened in my adult years immediately after the terrorists attacked the World Trade Center and flew the planes into the Pentagon and World Trade Center, after our nation watched the towers collapse, uh, after we saw smoke rising from the Pentagon, it was so bizarre when we would see those images coming to us on our television. And after we heard the heroic stories of the passengers of Flight 93 who fought back but lost their lives and the plane went down in the fields in Pennsylvania, I remember how America responded to that. Neighbors spoke to neighbors that they'd never even met. They talked about the attacks. Families called one another to check on them. People lined up across our nation in lines to give blood because we couldn't do much, but we knew we could do that. And so we did. I remember seeing spontaneous applause breaking out for first responders even when they were just helping at a traffic incident or a fender bender. But people would get out of their cars and their vehicles and just applaud those first responders. And for weeks, as first responders searched for survivors among the rubble of the World Trade Center, I remember seeing that massive American flag that waved and hung in the background. And even when the smoke began rising or the smoke continued to rise from the rubble, Americans said, how do we respond? And the greatest thing I remember seeing on television after that was the President of the United States standing in front of a full baseball stadium, throwing out the first pitch. And the, the, the stadium was packed and, and football arenas were even packed across the country as if to say, 
we are Americans. As if to say, you might have knocked us down, but we are going to get back up. You cannot break the American spirit. That season for me was the most patriotic season of my lifetime. Out of curiosity, if you have a similar recall of events uh, that happened, would you just raise your hand so I know that I'm not crazy? I remember our nation standing together as one. Yet today, almost 20 years later, the United States of America does not feel as united as we were then. Uh, it feels, I'm just saying, it feels like people are trying to divide us based on race. It, it feels like people are trying to divide us based on our political party. It, it feels like people that are trying to divide us using hate as a weapon. And honestly, our nation is as, as divided as I've ever seen it. So I, just a, a little bit of admission, I am an American citizen. I love the freedom that we have been given by God. I love that our declaration of independence begins with the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I do love my country, but... Sometimes I don't like it, right? As a follower of Jesus, how do we handle our responsibility as citizens of the United States of America and as followers of Jesus living in the United States of America? Today, as we look at Philippians 3, I hope that we are each challenged by the word of God because I believe that God has a message that's crucial for us to hear and to understand. So let's read together Philippians 3, beginning in verse 17. And let me just say this. I'm sorry about the heat. Do you feel the heat that I feel right now? Okay, great, then. Feels wonderful. Philippians 3, verse 17. Paul says this, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Now it's important to understand that at the time of this writing, Paul was being persecuted by his government. Paul was a Roman citizen and he was under house arrest because Roman guards were guarding him. It wasn't just the religious leaders, he was actually being persecuted by the government of Rome. He was upsetting the Roman culture because he insisted that, that salvation came from Jesus alone. And the culture of Rome was bothered by that because they had hundreds of gods that a person could believe in, multiple gods. Roman culture insisted that one must embrace this idea of a multi uh, multicultural gods, that you could have the God of fertility and the God of agriculture and the God of water and the God of the sun and all these gods. And Paul kept walking around saying, nope, there's only one God and his name is Jesus and he loves you and gave his life for you. So the Jewish leaders and the Roman leaders did not like it. In fact, a few years later, a Roman emperor named Nero would falsely accuse the Apostle Paul of setting the city of Rome on fire, and he would, as Christian scholars tell us, have Paul arrested 
and then later beheaded because of the crime that he accused him of. There's no doubt that Paul made it clear in Romans, uh, in Philippians 3, that if we have indeed surrendered our lives to Jesus, our citizenship is in heaven. Paul said clearly, we are citizens of heaven. That is where we belong. That is where we are going. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you too are a citizen of heaven. You belong there. That is your home. In fact, Paul writes in Galatians that you are a co-heir with Christ. Your sins have been forgiven. You've been adopted into God's family. You belong as a citizen of heaven. And some people take that idea to the extreme and they say that followers of Jesus really shouldn't be patriotic. Followers of Jesus should stay out of politics because that's where our citizenship is. Think about this. Now, when you surrendered your life to Jesus, you had a family. You had a family that you were responsible for. Maybe if you surrendered your life to Jesus as an adult, uh, you had children that you were responsible for, but you were also adopted into God's family. You're not called to abandon your earthly family to take care of your spiritual family. When I surrendered my life to Jesus, I became part of the family of God, and yet I still have family on this earth. I'm to be a good steward of my family and do all that I can to point them to Jesus. And also my treasure is in heaven, but I have earthly possessions here on this earth. God has called me to be a good steward of the physical things that I have to use them to bless other people, to be a good steward. And even though I'm a citizen of heaven, I was born on February 20th, 1973 in Lewiston, Maine, and I became a citizen of the United States of America. And I am to be a good steward of the nation that God has entrusted to me as well. See, I think it's good for followers of Jesus to remember that we are citizens of heaven first and our nation second. We're citizens of heaven first and our nation second. Paul stated clearly that we're citizens of heaven. And he says it quite a bit throughout his letters. Paul, but Paul says in verse 17 that he invites us to follow his example. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to look at how Paul, Paul balanced his life as a citizen of heaven and as a Roman citizen. Okay, so in Acts chapter 16, Paul was in Philippi. He was leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And he and Silas were arrested. They were beaten with rods. They were locked up within an inner dungeon. And while in prison, Paul led the Philippian jailer to Jesus. So the Philippian jailer takes him out. He takes him to his family. He leads the jailer's family to Jesus. And they all get baptized. They go to sleep there in the jail. The next morning, the city officials of Rome ordered the release of Paul and Silas. And you would think that Paul and Silas would hightail it out of there. They'd been beaten. They'd spent the night in jail. Yet, listen to what Paul said in Acts 16, verse 37. When the city officials ordered their release, Paul said, They have publicly beaten us without a trial and put us in prison, and we are Roman citizens. So now they want us to leave secretly? Certainly not. Let them come themselves to release us. When the police reported this, the city officials were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to the jail and apologized to them. Then they brought them out and begged them to leave the city. Now, do you hear the defiance in Paul's voice as he says that? I mean, he very clearly is saying, hey, look, what they did to us was illegal and wrong because we are Roman citizens. First, they should have put us on trial, but they skipped the whole trial and just punished us. But Paul also knew that he was a citizen of heaven. He also understood his rights as a Roman citizen. 
He knew that Paul and Silas had been arrested because they were followers of Jesus. But he also knew that what happened to him was illegal because he was a citizen of Rome. Here's what's interesting. Paul waited until after his arrest, after he was beaten, after he spent a night in jail before he said anything. Why did he do that? Why didn't he just at the gate say, hey, I'm a Roman citizen before you beat me with that rod? I'm a Roman citizen and what you're doing is illegal. Well, in this instance, I think it's because Paul knew that his pain could lead others to find freedom in Jesus. Paul believed that God had allowed his suffering so he could share his hope in Jesus with those that he was going to encounter. And that leads me to this thought, as citizens of heaven and the United States, our freedom should always advance the gospel and not hinder it. Our freedoms here as United States citizens should always advance the gospel and it should not hinder it. Now, as citizens of the U.S., we believe that we have been given those God-given rights, that we have the right to worship, we have the right to free speech, we have the right to bear arms, you can go down through the amendments, that we are free to align ourselves with a political party, we're free to support the candidate that we want, but because we're citizens of heaven, we're not free to be a jerk about it. We're, we're not free to be a jerk to other people and speak rudely to them and speak arrogantly to them and speak harshly to them. See, first we're followers of Jesus. We're citizens of heaven first. We should never allow our freedom to hinder the good news of Jesus. Rather, we should use our freedom to advance the good news of Jesus Christ. We see from Acts chapter 16 all the way through the end of Acts, Paul's example doing that over and over and over again as he's under arrest. He continues to use his Roman citizenship sat status to gain an audience and tell them about Jesus whether it's another crowd of people that we see in Acts 26, whether it's King Festus and King Agrippa that he speaks to, we see Paul continue to use his status as a Roman citizen to tell other people about Jesus. He understood that his rights as a Roman citizen should advance the gospel and not hinder it. See, when we elevate our rights as Americans higher than our responsibility to love God with all our heart and to love our neighbor as ourselves, we become jerks. We hinder the gospel. People don't want to hear what we have to say. So there's a balancing act for us as followers of Jesus because we, we love our nation, we love our country, we defend those rights. Yet we also must do it in a way that continues to point people to Jesus. We've got to do it in a way that doesn't turn into a argument that gets blown up every time we have the discussion. See, the, when we set our minds on earthly things, we actually become like those people that Paul described in Philippians 3.19. Did you catch what Paul said there in Philippians 3.19? He said, For many of whom I have often told you now tell you with tears in my eyes, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, their glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Catch the significance of those last few words. Paul was describing people that lived as enemies of the cross of Christ. And in the last few words, he said that enemies of the cross of Christ set their minds on earthly things. Setting our minds on earthly things is not the same thing as thinking about earthly things, okay? Now, I know this might shock you, it might surprise you, but I think about eating. In fact, just before the sermon, I was thinking about what I was going to eat later on. 
I think about food. I think about brewing coffee in the morning. I love it. I love the aroma. I love the beans grinding. I like thinking about it. I think about my wife. And really not in this order either. So I probably, <laughs> probably should have listed my wife first. Now I think about my children, I think about my future, I think about earthly things every single day. I think about the government, I think about our local school board, I think about the decisions that they make, I think about public education, I think about America and the political divide that we face. And then I go on to think and I think to myself, wouldn't it be amazing to have born again followers of Jesus running for office at the state, local and, and national level? I think that would be amazing. Wouldn't it be amazing if people understood that God has blessed them as citizens of the U.S. to point more people to Jesus? Wouldn't it be amazing to have followers of Jesus defending our freedoms, establishing justice, showing mercy, and walking humbly with God? And if you're a follower of Jesus, you are called first and foremost to advance God's kingdom. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the rest will be added to you. But when we set our minds on earthly things, we live as enemies of the cross of Christ. When we set our mind, it means we're obsessed and we're devoted to earthly things. I have news for you. You're not going to like this. Political parties are earthly things. They're earthly things. And when we become obsessed with it, when we set our minds on it, when we become fixed on it, we become like those that Paul described as enemies of the cross of Christ. See, when we, we set our minds on things like that, our mind is non-flexible. It's like concrete when it sets up. Our mind becomes so focused on earthly things, living for Jesus really no longer matters and loving our neighbor as ourselves no longer matters. So the question I ask myself often is this, is my mind right? So is my mind right? I don't want my mind set on earthly things. Because I could become very passionate about politics if I allowed myself to. And you know what I would end up doing? Ruining opportunities to talk about Jesus with people who didn't agree with me. Because they wouldn't want to hear what I have to say because I'm so passionate about politics. Is my mind right? Am I living more like a citizen of heaven or am I living more like a citizen of the United States? Do I place my political kingdom above God's kingdom? Am I more concerned about the borders of the United States of America than expanding the borders of God's kingdom and seeing more people surrender their lives to Jesus? Our patriotism is best demonstrated by being good stewards of the nation that God has entrusted to us. So we ought to live with gratitude that we do live in the very best nation that this world has ever seen. We have been given freedoms unlike any other. And we need to use our freedom to tell other people about Jesus because Jesus is the one that transforms lives. And when lives gets transformed, thoughts are transformed and people begin viewing and thinking differently. See, God heals divided families. We've seen that happen. God restores marriages. We've seen that happen. And God can unify divided churches, and God also can unify our nation. We talk about division. We see it. We hear it. But God and God alone can bring healing if we turn to him and continue to put him first above country, him first in our lives, him first above our marriages and above our children, him first, we will see God truly bring healing. I hope to see it in my lifetime. 
I hope that we all get to experience that. But if not, I know that I'm a citizen of heaven. And one day I'm going to see unity among God's people. And it's going to be an awesome thing. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you that Paul teaches us a little bit about his life. That even as a Roman citizen, he lived as a citizen of heaven. And that even when he became defiant in some ways, he only became defiant to advance the gospel. Lord, teach us how to learn from his example and help us to give our lives to what truly matters, leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Help us to walk with humility around people that we disagree with. Help us to show kindness and tenderness to those that disagree with us. And Father, help us in all things to put you very first in our lives. You desire that we seek your kingdom first. Forgive us, God, when we've sought to, to put our kingdom in front of yours. Father, we love you and we're so grateful that you've blessed us with being born in this country. Father, help us to follow you, to lead others to Jesus, and to listen to your spirit as you guide us as we walk in this foreign land. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Let's stand.